Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, welcome to everyone on the live stream. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, so on behalf of my co-organizers, uh, Ian Lundberg, Alex Kindle, and Sarah McClanahan, it's our great honor to welcome you all here today for the second day of the Fragile Families Challenge Scientific Workshop. Uh, usually these things end with thank yous, but here I think it should start with a thank you because pretty much everyone in this room contributed to making this possible in some way. Uh, many of you prepared the data, analyzed the data, helped make the challenge run smoothly, funded the challenge. So this, you know, we, we talked about this as a mass collaboration and it's so nice to see many of those collaborators here all in the same room. So everyone, I would just like to have a quick round of applause. Thank you. Um, so what I want to talk about today, and Sarah will talk as well at the beginning, we want to give you all some background of the Fragile Family Study, talk a little bit about how it began, and what, are some, what has been learned as it's gone along. And then I'll talk a little bit more about the challenge and what happened. Many of you were participants in the challenge, uh, but this will be a chance for, for you to hear about how the challenge went in sort of a more aggregate way. And then I'll talk some about the plans for the rest of today. So now Sarah will come and talk about the Fragile Families and Child Wellbeing Study. This has been a very interesting learning experience for me. And I uh, thank you all for that, too, as well as your contributions. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the uh, Fragile Family Study, why we did it, kind of what are some of the main findings, and sort of give you a picture of where the challenge fits in to the larger scheme of things. So first of all, the, the original study was really motivated by these trends that are showing on the figure, by a very large increase in births to unmarried parents that occurred uh, after 1960. So you can see that it's broken out by different race ethnic groups, that all the groups, even though African Americans, it was more common among, um, the, the increase occurred among all the racial and ethnic groups. And this, in, this increase sort of led to a number of questions. Uh, first of all, we wanted to know what is the nature of these parents' relationships when their child is born. At the time, uh, which was in the mid-1990s, there were all kinds of different stories. Some columnists were talking about these births as uh, the result of one-night stands. Uh, mothers don't even know who the fathers were. There were op-ed pieces written to that effect. On the other hand, there were people that were saying, There's not, this isn't a big deal. All of these unmarried parents are in cohabiting relationships. This is what's going on in Norway and Sweden, and we shouldn't worry about it. It's just a different form of marriage. So there were all these different stories. So the first thing is we wanted to figure out what is the nature of these relationships? Are they committed or casual? Uh, the second question was what are the parents' capabilities and especially the unmarried fathers? It turned out that we didn't have a good estimate or a kind of population-based estimate of what the characteristics of these fathers were. People had tried to go out and sample unmarried fathers or get a list of them you could sample from, and you couldn't find them. So for, for example, for every 100 women who said they had a child outside marriage, only 60 men gave that answer. So that this led to what was called the missing fathers problem. And so because a lot of the men maybe didn't know they were unmarried fathers, although that's probably not the case. A lot of them just sort of didn't report it in a survey. So we had this problem. We were very interested in knowing what was the, one question was what was the uh, ability of these non-resident fathers to pay child support? That was part of the original motivation. So the second question was what happens to these relationships over time? Are they stable, like marriage, or are they something different? Um, then a Another question was, what role does the government and the government policies and programs play in the lives of fragile families? And then finally, the question of how do children fare in these families? So in order to do that, we decided to start with the birth of the child. And being a demographer, I had this great insight that all the children born have a father. <laughs> 
And so if you want to get data on the characteristics of unmarried fathers, you should start with the birth of a child. And interview, if you can, both the mother and the father as soon as possible after the birth. And even if you can't interview all the fathers, you can at least ask the mother about the characteristics of their partner at the time of birth. So for that reason, we decided we'd go to the hospitals. We would sample, well, first of all, we sampled uh, cities from a population of 77 cities with, with uh, populations of 200,000 or more. So that was our population that we wanted to be able to um, um, refer to. So we, we sampled cities, and then within each 20, we had 20 cities in all. Uh, five of them were added as special cities by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And so we had kind of uh, 16 nationally simple 16 cities that were part of the national uh, sample, and then another four to five that were added for this particular foundation. So within each city, once so we sampled the cities, then within each city we sampled hospitals. Some cities, there were not so many hospitals we could get into all of the hospitals, and others we had to sample the hospitals, like New York City. We couldn't get into all of their hospitals. So once we sampled the hospitals, we were in 75 hospitals all in all. We sampled beds so that we could get the births in those beds in the hospital. So that's sort of how we drew the original sample. Then we oversampled births to unmarried parents. So we ended up with about 3,600 births to unmarried parents and about 1,400, 1,300 births to married parents. Uh, we then interviewed both parents um, at birth if they were in the hospital. Turns out one of the nurses had told us this before, but that the unmarried fathers often come to the hospital to see the baby. And they don't come, we, we piloted trying to do this in prenatal clinics. So when the mother goes in for her prenatal checkup, the fathers don't go to that. But they do come in to see the baby when it's born. So we were able to interview about 75% of the unmarried fathers at the hospital. And then we got up to another 10% sort of at some point outside the hospital. So then we interviewed the mother and the father at birth. Uh, we did follow interviews when the children were 1, 3, 5, 9, and 15 years old. And we're hoping to do another round of interviews at, when the children are age 22. So from the very beginning, this uh, study has been very collaborative. We've had, uh, we never had enough money to do all the things we wanted to do, which turned out to be a really good thing. Because by not having all the money we needed to do what we wanted to do, we had to form partnerships with other people who would raise money to add things they wanted to add to our data. So here is a list of different kinds of data that have been added to the study. Julian Teitler and Nancy Reichman uh, added data on the hospital records of all the mothers that were in the study. They hired Two women who went around in a trailer, or a, what do you call the, the driving mobile things, home. mobile home. They went around all 20 cities and went into the hospitals. And what they figured out how to do this, and they did it for all the cities. Then uh, Jenny Brooks Gunn and her colleagues wrote uh, proposals that would allow us to interview child care providers and kindergarten teachers. That was a total separate kind of project. We did another model, a module on child abuse and neglect. Uh, another one on incarceration. One of the big findings that came out of the first two cities that we uh, conducted uh, surveys in was that a lot of the fathers, unmarried fathers, were in jail. So in the first two cities that we did, Austin and Oakland, which turned out to have very, very high incarceration rates, those states, but we found that about 5% of the fathers were in jail at the time of birth, and that really said to us, if that many are in jail at the time of birth, just think of how many may have cycled in and out. So we added this module to uh, study that. We also added a module on religion to get more detailed in just what religion are you and how often do you get, go to church. And then we added some qualitative interviews. Kathy Eden and Paula England, uh, conduct, they followed about 150 of the couples of, who were in a relationship at birth. They followed them for about a year and a half, up to two years, to kind of see if what we saw at birth was in fact true, if you, or maybe people were kind of overestimating or, uh, what was going on in their relationship. So since that time, we've continued to have these extensions uh, to the study. So in um, 
in the nine-year survey, we collected saliva samples from the mothers and the children, and we we're analyzing uh, the DNA and creating polygenetic stores and doing other kinds of biomarkers with that data. And there's a lot of big data in the DNA uh, sample. Then we added a sleep study that a colleague out at uh, Stony Brook added where they put actigraphy things on the kids. Is that right, Brooke? <laughs> Fitness, okay, and then they could find out the kind of type of sleep when they slept. Uh, we did a teen diary study uh, where they followed some uh, relationships very intensely every two weeks. We did little uh, smartphone surveys in, at age 15 for teenagers that were in a relationship. Uh, we, in Michigan and Toledo, we brought the children into the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor uh, with some psychologists and did fMRIs uh, on the kids. And then, um, last but last not least, we're in the Fragile Families Challenge. Um, so one thing about this data set that's made it so uh, sort of attractive to all these add-on studies is, first of all, we have the data from birth. So that's pretty unusual in the US to have a population-based sample. But more importantly, perhaps, because we oversampled for non-marital births, we have a very large sample of disadvantaged kids. So about half of our sample is black, about a third are Hispanic, including about half of them are immigrant kids. So their parents are immigrants, they're US citizens. Um, and then about 20% of the sample is white. So this is very unusual to have this large a sample. So a lot of people that want to study environmental effects on disadvantaged uh, families, this is an ideal set for doing that. Do I have some more time? Yeah. All right, so let me tell you just a few tidbits about what we've learned. So the first thing we found was that at birth, these unmarried parents had high hopes for their relationship. About 51% were living together, so the Swedish Scandinavian model wasn't entirely wrong. About another 32% were in a dating relationship, so they were in a romantic relationship but living apart. And then about 8% were friends, and about 9% had no contact with each other. So these definitely were not the casual one-night stand relationships that some people had talked about. And it was this um, finding that prompted the qualitative study that Kathy Eden and Paula England followed up because one of the colleagues of mine, we were talking about this finding and someone said, oh, this is just Sarah's magic moment. This is a nanosecond, you know, when they're all... They're all optimistic at the hospital, the baby's just born, and that's not really what's going on. But the, the qualitative studies suggested that, was, that, that it was, they were in relationships. The relationships don't last very long, as I'll show you in a minute. But at the time of the birth, the first year, there really is a lot of, uh, of attachment there between the couples and between the parents and children. So just another example of some of the things we learned during, in the, at the, from the baseline interviews, the fathers gave money and things for the child. They helped in other ways. They visited the mother in the hospital. The child's going to take the father's surname. Uh, the father's name is going to be on the birth certificate. Most importantly, well, both these last two, the, the father says he wants to be involved, and the mother wants the father to be involved. So this was a big, sh this was before a lot of these fatherhood programs had started. And this was a big surprise to a lot of uh, of researchers who had kind of based their, their sample of poor people or poor single mothers on mothers on welfare. And so this is not that sample. It's, they are poor, but they're not on welfare, and the fathers are not out of the picture. And so it changed the way I think a lot of people thought about how they wanted to deal with these families, what kinds of restrictions, were, make sure they weren't discouraging the father to be involved in the, with the child. So then, so the high hopes but low capabilities of the parents. So here I've just highlighted some uh, rows that you might want to compare with the married and unmarried. But just looking at the mothers, you can see here that the unmarried mothers are much more disadvantaged in terms of education, in terms of poverty status, uh, in terms of health than the married mothers. So these are two very different populations. Uh, the last uh, point over there, the, the bottom row, we asked the mothers and the fathers about the fathers, whether they'd ever been incarcerated. And this is where we found out that almost 40% of the fathers had been incarcerated at some time 
uh, at the, by the time of the birth of the child. By the end of the start survey, that number had gone up to over 50%. So this was also the first time that we had sort of collect, connected the dots between the, uh, these very disadvantaged unmarried couples and the role of the criminal justice system in their lives. And in fact, when the National Academy of Science did a report a few years ago about high rates of incarceration, this, the, most of the evidence about the effects on families and children come from this data set because other studies just haven't collected the data. And we sort of just happened to do it because we found these first two cities, the incarceration rates were so high. So that's the birth picture. At birth, there are high hopes, uh, lots of father involvement, uh, low capabilities, but then what happens? So this figure really shows what percent of the couples have broken up by the time the child is 1, 3, 5, 9, and 15. And you can see that the kids born to married parents, um, what is that, 35% of them have ended their relationship at the time the child is 15. But that's much lower than the children born to cohabiting and, and romantic relationship parents. So there are very, very high rates of dissolution of these relationships. Um, Oops. So what happens when you have this very high rate of dissolution is that the mothers and the fathers are repartnering during the child's early uh, life course. So the parents, in a way, I think of this, the parents are sort of doing their search for their partner at the same time that they're having new children. So whereas in the old days, you know, you sort of got married, maybe after seven years on average you got divorced, you'd had your two children, and then maybe you remarried, but you didn't have more children. <coughs> so what happens here is that these relationships, there's so much turnover. And you can see here that for the uh, cohabiting and non-residential parents, that there's about, what is that, three, uh, a, a large chunk, 20%, have had three or more transitions by the time the child's age 15. So lots of partnership changes in these families. And then the partnership families lead to something that we call family complexity. Some people call it multi-partnered fertility. But what it really means is you're getting a lot of families in which the, their children are half-siblings with different fathers. And this is kind of a big topic that family sociologists and demographers like to study because these families are very complicated. Um, Okay, the last question, or the next to the last question, is what does government programs uh, do in the lives of fragile families? And you can see here, so the pink part of the bar uh, is, shows you what families get from government programs, both in-kind and cash transfers. And you can see that for the single mother families, uh, and then all fragile families, this includes the singles, those who were single and married at birth, that the government transfers account for a huge amount of the, the money that they live on. And then finally, uh, as compared with children born to married parents, the children born to unmarried parents, they do less well in school, the GPA, they exhibit more behavior problems, they have more mental health problems, and they're more physical health problems. So there are all kinds of debates about whether uh, the family situation per se is what caused all these problems or if it's something that's associated with the family. Uh, but I would say that based on everything that I've read and done in the last 15 or 20 years, I would say that the largest effects on net causal effects on children are really by affecting these behavioral problems. So kids are less likely to finish high school, for example, or less likely to have GPA, high GPAs, but not because their cognitive test scores are different. It's more like they don't attend school, they're not as engaged. So there's something about the social emotional effects of these complicated families that seems to, and the effects are greater for boys. Uh, for the mechanisms, why do we find this? So prior research has focused on the economic disadvantages of these families, poverty, material hardship, one of your outcomes. Um, there's community disadvantages, partly because of the poverty they're living in low, uh, the kids live in low quality neighborhoods and they go to low quality schools. And then finally, the family disadvantages. So what all of this complication and instability, ultimately, there's a lot of data that show it leads to 
declines in the quality of both the mother and the father's parenting. Uh, and poor parent-child relationships. So, you know, maybe a new father moves in. So the father moves out, now there's only one parent. New father moves in, now there's two parents of higher income. But the father isn't maybe as committed to that child, maybe because he has a child in another household or in two different households. Or the child sort of isn't ready to accept what the father wants to give him. It's hard to know how much is the father and how much is the child, but everybody has heard the expression of the kid saying to the step-parent, you're not my real parent, you can't tell me what to do. So you have that, you know, a lot of that in these families. Uh, so how can the challenge help? So what we're really hoping is that you guys can look at the data in a different way, and you can identify for us some new mechanisms that we hope to explore in the data we already have and in the surveys that we hope to uh, launch in when the kids are 22. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so, uh, out of that background um, and a number of <clears throat> other things that have been happening, we ended up with the Fragile Families Challenge. Um, so, part of that comes out of a book I've been working on called Bit by Bit Social Research in the Digital Age that's about trying to combine data science and social science. And part of that is out of some conversations I've been having with Duncan and, and Duncan Watts and colleagues about how we could make social science more awesome. And <laughs> so out of that whole stew of things and many conversations with Sarah and Ian and Alex, we ended up with the Fragile Families Challenge. So um, I think a big inspiration for the challenge was Wikipedia. So Wikipedia is amazing because They've solved this really big intellectual problem of writing an encyclopedia, but they didn't need any new knowledge. All the knowledge that was needed to create Wikipedia already existed. What they needed to create Wikipedia was a new system of collaboration. And so that leads to a question of what other kinds of big intellectual challenges do we already have all the knowledge we need to solve if we just had a better way of collaborating? And so this idea of mass collaboration in science is not at all new. So hundreds of biologists work together to sequence the Human Genome Project. So here's the list of authors for that paper. Um, and thousands of physicists work together to find the Higgs boson. So there were 5,000 physicists and engineers who worked on this paper. Here's what 5,000 <laughs> authors looks like. Collaborating, by the way, from all over the world. So here are all of their institutions. <laughs> so we wondered what would happen if hundreds of social scientists and data scientists participated in a mass collaboration. What would that look like? And what if that mass collaboration was designed to improve the lives of disadvantaged kids in the US? And that is the Fragile Families Challenge, which you all participated in and helped make possible. And so. One way to think about what we're doing is we're trying to combine ideas from social science and data science to help understand the world better and solve an important social problem. So one brief way of summarizing that is to think about sort of the two cultures of statistical modeling in these communities. Uh, the social scientists have this sort of beta hat culture. For those of you who are in regression models, the y hat is the outcome and the beta hats are the weights on the parameters. So I'm a sociologist here, and most of the talks I go to have a kind of general strategy. They have some theoretical introduction, there's a description of the data, then there's the table of regression coefficients that no one can read, and then there's the discussion about one particular beta hat. And everyone says, this is my beta hat, and this is, I've learned something about the world. Um, and then I had a sabbatical for a year at Microsoft Research, and I sat in on some of the talks there, a lot of which were machine learning talks. And I sat through my first talk, and I was like, Where's, where are the beta hats? Where's the table? <laughs> and then I noticed that many of the talks did not have that, and instead they really tended to focus on something else, which was the predictive performance of the models. So for example, imagine you were building a, a spam detector, right? You, really are interested in whether you are detecting correctly whether a piece of e email is spam or not spam. And so, um, but it seems like both of these approaches 
are a little bit incomplete. So if you think about a regression model, it is both the y hats and the beta hats. And so to focus on one and not focus on the other seems like you're missing part of the story, each of these communities. And so we try to think of this challenge as a way of bringing these two modeling cultures together. And so one way to think about what we're doing is y hats in the service of beta hats. And so a lot of, or prediction in the service of understanding. So a lot of what's happened so far is the predictive modeling part. And then what will happen next is going to be more of trying to use what happened in this first stage to help us understand more about the issues that Sarah was describing. So uh, Sarah described the data. And I think, I hope now everyone uh, who in the challenge appreciates the amount of complexity and work that went into creating the data. Um, one way to look at the data is sort of like this. We heard there's sort of these core modules. So these are the different modules, and then these are the time periods. And so there are the core modules with the mother and the father, and then these are the different modules that were added on. So now, at this moment, the age 15 data has been collected and is here in this building, um, but is not yet publicly available because the final data cleaning and data preparation is still going on. And so this creates a beautiful structure to have a challenge where you have some data that's been collected, but it's not yet publicly available. So this is the way that many of the fragile families and social sci fragile families researchers and social scientists think about the data, and this is the way many machine learning researchers would think about the data. Uh, so you have a big matrix. There are 5,000 families. There are 12,000 features. So variables. Social scientists, they are variables. Data scientists, they are features. Um, so that is actually one of the issues that has come up repeatedly during the challenge is the difficulty of actually communicating across fields. But at, at dinner, I, there was this wonderful conversation I had with someone who I, I won't name, who was like, you know, at first I was really intimidated by all this stuff the data scientists were saying. But then I realized it's all the same stuff we say. <laughs> they just have different words for it. Um, so features is just variables, and variables is just features. Um, and then we have a bunch of data from age 15, which is not yet publicly available. Um, so what we did is we picked six key outcomes that we thought were important for scientific reasons. Uh, and we released half of the data for these six outcomes. And you all built models to try to predict. You, train, you, you built models using this training data to try to predict the leaderboard and the holdout data. So as I said, there's sort of this two-step process. The first is to use the common task method. This is the part that focuses on prediction. And then we're going to, in the second step, use all these submissions to do cool stuff. Um, that will be defined sort of at the end of the day when I'll talk more about what are the next steps. But I think the idea, the key idea here is that we should think of what's happening now not as the end, but as the beginning. Um, because many of these uh, prediction challenges in machine learning, usually they pick the winner, and then it's over. And that's not what's happening here. So this is really just a milestone that we've hit, but there's lots more stuff to come. So what we're going to talk about now is what happened during the predictive modeling stage. So the six key outcomes were GPA, material hardship, grit. Those are all continuous outcomes. And then we also had three binary outcomes, eviction, uh, job training, and job loss. So some of these outcomes are really properties of the child. Some of them are really properties of the primary caregiver. And some of them are sort of properties of the household. Um, so we had 441 registered participants. Uh, it was a mix of social scientists and data scientists. It was a mix of undergraduates, graduate students, and professionals. So professionals includes professors, but it also includes not professors. It includes professional data scientists who work at companies. Uh, and many of these participants worked in teams, particularly interdisciplinary teams, which was really exciting to see. Um, and what I've heard from participants in those teams was that was actually a really valuable learning experience to be forced to, not to be forced, but to <laughs> have the experience. But it's also sort of being forced to, to really think about the world in a different way through the eyes of someone who's trained differently. Um, so here are the number of submitted models by day. Uh, and so we had over 3,000 models submitted to the leaderboard. 
Um, this burst of traffic so, uh, is related to a deadline in Barbara Engelhart's machine learning class. So uh, <laughs> our very first uh, group of participants was the undergraduate machine learning class here at Princeton. One of the students in that class is here today to present her results. Uh, there are other people here maybe in the class. Uh, and then this peak here is related to another deadline in Barbara Engelhart's class. This was the end of the semester. Uh, and then this peak here is, is related to the end of the challenge when many of you were rushing to get your best models in. Um, so how did all of these models do? Um, so here is the mean squared error in the holdout set. So this is the data that no one had access to when they were building their models. And th this is the mean squared error. So uh, now the challenge is you might say, well, I don't really know how to interpret this mean squared error. And that's true that in this setting, we don't really have a good baseline for thinking what's a good or a bad mean squared error. And so here I reverted to one of my favorite data analysis techniques, which is a scatter plot. And so here we have the true outcome on the x-axis. And then this is the best individual prediction on the y-axis. So if the, the models were working perfectly, it would all fall along the 45 degree line. This is for material hardship. So you can see that the best, the very best prediction that was submitted, not that great. Uh, here it is for GPA. Here it is for grit. <laughs> Um, so now if you wanted to make a one number summary of this, you could use R squared, which is about the sort of amount of variability that's explained by the predictors. And here's a graph of the R squareds for the continuous outcomes. So GPA about 0.2, grit about 0.05, and material hardship also about 0.2. So let me just show you these in a different way, which is this which is actually the range of possible things for R squared, which, as you all know, goes from 0 to 1. And so to me, this is one of the most surprising outcomes. This is probably, for me personally, this is the most surprising outcome. That is, we have this amazing data that's been collected since birth, very careful, detailed data. And we have fantastic machine learning methods from hundreds of people participating. And this is the best result so far. So I think one of the many, many questions that this challenge raises is what else is going on here? And we have a lot of ideas about that. Um, and we, we may hear about some of them today. And we, we will talk a little bit more about that uh, in the final session. So another common question is who won? And the answer is we all won. Uh, <laughs> no, but seriously, like this is not just you know, this is a mass collaboration. There is a competitive aspect, but that is not the only aspect of it. But here are the people who won, and we'll be hearing from them later today. So GPA, GRIT, and Layoff were won by a team from the MIT Media Lab, led by Abdullah Amatouk. Uh, job training and eviction were from, uh, led, uh, from a team at MDRC, led by Kristen Porter. And Material Hardship was a team of PhD students in Princeton in the Department of Politics, led by Eric Wang. So they will all present later this afternoon. But it's also true that there were many, many models submitted that had very similar predicted performance to the very best ones. And so again, this is not just about who can get to the finish line faster. A lot of these other models, for all practical purposes, may have had very similar performance. And so we also think there's a lot to learn from all of the models that were in the top 10, and even some of the models that didn't have really good predictive performance. Uh, because it's actually very valuable for us to know which approaches didn't work very well. Right? So if we only focus on the approaches that worked well, we're going to miss a lot of information from the approaches that didn't work well. Um, so there's a lot of learning in all of these. And that's why we're going to have a special issue of a journal. And for this special issue, the predictive performance is not a primary criteria in deciding whether to accept it or not. It's whether this makes an intellectual contribution. Uh, so there's a lot to learn from all of these uh, contributions. Uh, <clears throat> as many of you know, the, one of the ideas we had is to, we would try to combine all of these predictive models into a single community model. And there are a number of results from machine learning that suggest this ensemble of models should do better than the best individual model. So how did that work out? 
So this is the community predictions for material hardship, GPA, and grit, and they look very similar to the best individual models, and that is, in fact, what happened. So we see that for, G the, for the continuous ones in terms of R squared, the GPA was the community model did a tiny, tiny bit worse. For material hardship, the community model did a tiny, tiny bit better. Basically, they did the same. For grit, the community model seemed to help some. And so this is something we are investigating further. And if you are an expert in ensemble techniques, particularly stacking with L2 penalties, please come and talk to us. Um, so again, though, the community model did not help address this sort of big unanswered question. So let's talk now a little bit about what's going to happen today. So in addition to hearing from the prize winners about how they approach the challenge, We've also asked them to reflect a little bit on some of the deeper issues that, that they experienced as a part of doing this, or that they, the sort of general implications of what happened for how we should think about social science, or data science, or social problems. The idea is we don't want just to think about how we did the cross-validation to tune our hyperparameters. We also want to think about some of the issues the challenge raised. So these could be things like, what is the role of prediction in the social science? How can social scientists and data scientists collaborate more effectively? How could we increase the predictability of social outcomes? Like, what is all of that white space? Are there some fundamental limits that we will not be able to uh, overcome? Should more social research adopt the common task method? <coughs> how might future challenges be improved based on what we've learned from this challenge? And how, if at all, should the results inform social policy? So this is some of the questions that we've been talking about amongst ourselves, and these are some of the themes that we expect will come up today in the presentations, in the Q&A, during the coffee breaks. And in fact, we hope there will be other themes that we haven't thought of. In fact, that would be great. Um, so what we're going to have is a series of presentations. So first, we're going to have a panel from the progress winners, uh, Ona Verol, Julia Wang, and Steve McKay. Well, first, we're going to have a coffee break. Then we're going to have the first panel, and they'll give talks, and then we'll have a chance to, we'll ask sort of clarifying questions during the talk, and we'll hold the questions until the end when they have a panel, so that way we can have more of a discussion and think about how the work is related. Then we'll have another coffee break, we'll have a presentations from the foundational prize winner, so this was the prize that went to the person that most helped other people during the challenge. Um, then we will have lunch, we will have presentations from the innovation prize winners, and then uh, presentations from the final prize winners. And then Sarah and I will come back at the end and talk some about next steps for the Fragile Families and Fragile Families Challenge. So thank you all. And we look forward to a really exciting and productive day. So let's have some coffee. <laughs>